Welcome to Miguelia Rose Studio. The first thing I want to say is a huge thank you to all my subscribers. I've taught watercolor for many years and having your support means so very much to me. Now, whether you're interested in traditional watercolor or watercolor batik, this is a demonstration that you might find interesting. Rather than working with one or two main elements, I'm reaching for the fun challenge of working with the different colors and personalities of 12 goats. The painting I'll be demonstrating is a watercolor batik and is titled Las Cabras, which means the goats, was inspired by a herd of goats that was recently fenced near my home to graze and remove some of the high grasses that might be a wildfire danger. They were a delight to watch and an inspiration to paint. I wanted to convey a feeling of joyful confusion. If you ever find yourself at a loss of a subject to paint, relax. Inspiration can come from any direction at any time, so look around. Subjects can be as near as a bowl of fruit in your kitchen, a pet, a relative, or even yourself. Now that you know the subject for this painting, let's follow the steps I used to create the watercolor batik painting Las Cabras. I decided to focus on the faces rather than the entire bodies of the goats. My search for reference photos in addition to those I already took on my digital camera led me to several copyright free photo sites such as pixabay.com and unsplash.com. If you don't use your own photos as reference material, be sure not to use someone else's. Photos without permission is just not the right thing to do and could be a legal issue. Here are a few more photographs of samples that I used for my goat painting. The process of putting a composition together was a bit time consuming. I knew what I wanted and the rather slow process of creating a collage of images drawn from photo references finally gave me the composition I wanted. Here's an image of the photo references and the initial drawings. Using the photos I chose, I first enlarged them to the size I desire so they would fit on a half sheet of gin washi paper which measures about 19 inches by 25 inches. I first scan each drawing into my computer, enlarge each one in my Microsoft Publisher program. After printing each enlargement on cardstock, it is then cut out and I begin to arrange them in a variety of ways to see which I prefer. Here's an image of the first version of the collage and I will be beginning to finalize that for transfer to an actual piece of drawing paper. I can still move things around, but right now this is looking like what I'm going to go with initially. Since I rarely have tracing paper large enough to do the uh, full size of the jinwashi, I go ahead and tape together sheets of tracing paper, and then I'm going to trace onto those the first prototype of my composition made with my little goat cutouts. Here you can see the complete collage transferred to the tracing paper. Uh, with some notations I've made regarding their color and the pattern of the goats. Using a light box, I transfer the image that I had on tracing paper onto a large sheet of drawing paper that will be the approximate size of the jinwashi. The next step, although time consuming, I always include in my process so that I understand the colors I will be using and where to place various elements such as the location of white areas. I fold my paper into 8.5 by 11 inch sections and then scan each one onto cardstock using my computer and printer. I then tape each sheet together until I have reproduced the entire image on cardstock. I then begin to use watercolors to block in the goats and the approximate colors I plan to use. I like to use cardstock because the paint dries very quickly. As I continue painting, I decide that I don't like the goat in the lower right hand corner and I've decided to change the color or even possibly change the goat image that I've been using. Using blank cardstock paper, I block out the first goat and decide on a completely different approach. I will use the back of a goat. At times I like to throw in something different and this would definitely qualify. 
Here you can see the antisocial goat I have drawn to fit into that troublesome corner. Here the new goat has been pasted onto the cardstock and is ready to paint. I just wanted to take a minute to talk about my favorite paper to use for watercolor batik and that is a Japanese paper called Jin Washi. Uh, it has a slightly tan cast. You can get it in pure white, but I usually like the, the slight tonality. It's very thin rice paper and it's embedded with short fibers. You can almost see the uh, painting I have laid underneath this one sheet of Jinwashi of a flag I had painted uh, some years ago. Now, the Jinwashi of colors will run on it, watercolor especially, and that's why waxing preserves the areas you don't want that to happen. You'll have to work carefully and plan what areas you don't want any colors to bleed into. Another thing I'd like to point out with Jin Washi, beside it being quite thin, uh, very, very strong when dry, but not so strong when wet, but that it has a smooth and a rough side, and you can feel the fibers more readily on the rough side. And color will follow those fibers more easily than the smooth side. Uh, so I like to use that rough side for animal subjects, uh, running so that it's sort of perhaps a fur effect. But either side is fun and unpredictable. Now I feel a little more comfortable with the overall color plan. I return to the paper composition and update it with my non-social goat. I am ready to transfer the composition to the one-half sheet of Jin Washi paper now. Jin Washi has a smoother side and a rougher side, and I have decided to use the rough side. I use an ultra-fine black Sharpie to draw on the Jin Washi paper. Whatever you use to transfer your image, be sure it is waterproof. You do not want to have run, ink running when it's wet. Before I attach the gin washi paper to a silk support board, I always cover the board with clean plastic freezer paper with the shiny side up. I make my support board by taping several layers of cardboard together. Here is a photo of a covered support board previously used for a batik painting. The chance of previously used wax and watercolor melting into the new painting is not worth the risk I'm willing to take. Here's a photo of my clean covered support board which is now ready to have the image traced onto the jinwashi attached with push pins. Now it's time to begin the first application of watercolor. This photo shows the first application of watercolor. I usually begin with the lightest areas first, and in this instance the white goats, and some of the white markings on other goats. Here's a close-up showing you some of the shading that I use. Notice the uh, bleeding areas. I'm going to talk about that in just a moment. I continue adding watercolor in areas where any bleeding of color into adjacent areas won't cause problems. This takes some thought and experience, but face it, we learn from mistakes and sometimes they are happy accidents. Here is a photo of my basic wax melting setup. I use a very small electric skillet um, that I usually set the temperature between 180 and 200 degrees Fahrenheit. I use metal cans to put the wax in and I set them in the skillet and always have water around them. This has to be what I guess would be considered a double boiler or a wet bath of hot water to uh, melt the wax that's within the cans. The forefront there shows the brushes I use. Most of them are standard watercolor brushes and once a brush is used for wax application it's almost impossible to clean it so don't use your best brushes here. You buy some inexpensive brushes that you don't mind losing. And again, always use safety. These are hot, hot, hot things, and always keep that water level up. Here is a detail from one of the goats, and you can see I have uh, marked in some of the horn, inner ear, eyes, and nose areas. As I mentioned earlier, it takes some experience to know which areas to paint and when to wax. For example, after I painted the inner ears, the horns, the eyes, the nose area, and even the little beard on this goat, 
uh, before I added his actual uh, fur color, the, the pretty brown, I waxed those areas first so that you can see the unwaxed areas around the goat, the color bled in. But the areas that I had waxed, such as his eyes and his inner ears and his nose area and the beard, are not getting the bleeding because they have been waxed. So think ahead and make your plans carefully. This photo shows the third application of watercolor and I have waxed over all the goats and you can still see how I have predominantly progressed from lighter colors to darker being careful to wax the painted areas I don't want affected by new watercolor applications. At this point the goats have been painted and I am ready to go ahead and think about the background. Here's a detailed photo of the darkest goat in the middle of the painting and he has been covered with one coat of melted wax. I have now moved on to painting the background areas. I have decided on a subdued green which is a combination of sap green, deep sap green and burnt sienna. Here is a detail of the goats with the background painting. You can get a better look at the color. And I did pick sort of a bland background here behind the goat so that any of the cracking and batik effects will be more visible. Once that background area that I painted is completely dry, and I'm pretty sure that to all the goats have been waxed over, I brush a melted wax over the entire painting. I call this the cracking layer. Once cool, this is the layer of wax when cracked allows a dark wash to seep onto the painting creating that unique batik look. Here is a close up of one of the goats. You can see all the previous layers that I have put over him and the final cracking layer it leaves the image somewhat obscured. At, depending on the painting and the number of layers of wax you can sometimes not see too much of the painting and this is where it starts to begin interesting and exciting and wondering what do I have beneath all that wax. This is just a, a handy hint. The wax will crack better if it's cool. So if it's a warm day I use either ice bags or frozen vegetable bags laid onto the painting and move them around until the wax is quite cool to the touch. I now remove the push pins and lift the painting from the support board releasing any areas of melted wax that are sticking to the board. Some cracking may occur at this time and actually that's good. Lay the painting back down on the support board and using your hands randomly crack the wax. Here's a sample of what the wax looks like when it is cracked. You might want to avoid overcracking certain areas if your painting includes people's faces or highly detailed areas. Here is another example of what the wax looks like once it's been cracked. Here is the other sample and cracking is something that you just cannot be sure what you're going to get. Uh, the wax um, may allow some of the wash to flow through, sometimes it, it doesn't. But that is again part of the mystique and fun of batik. You don't know what's going to happen but it's always fun and I'm always surprised at the results. Now I prepare um, a watercolor wash which in this instance I use indigo mixed with water. The wash shouldn't be too thick because you want it to seep into the cracks of the wax layer. So it's going to be again one of the things that you just have to learn through experience. And you can vary the color of the wash. I sometimes use browns, greens, and sometimes several different washes in different areas. So this is something you can always experiment with. Using a large wash brush, you can see here that I've applied that wash over the entire painting. I'm going to show you a detail next. Here you can see how the wax that I put over the entire painting has resisted the watercolor wash and it would just sit here unless we did follow up with the next step which is putting another layer of wax over the entire painting. Now the final layer of wax that I've brushed over the entire painting is done to press that dark wash into some of the cracks and this will allow that wax to reach the surface of the painting. 
This is an unpredictable process and you won't know the final result until you remove all the wax layers with a hot iron. I recommend that you don't leave the painting too long at this stage. 5 to 15 minutes should be sufficient as the wash will continue to work into the painting. Here's a photo of beginning to iron off the wax. I use plain newsprint to absorb the wax as I iron. I have found in the past printed newspapers will sometimes transfer the ink onto the painting and any glossy paper will not absorb the wax. Use care in this process as you are working with hot iron and also that hot melted wax. Protect the area all around and use ventilation. The wax removal process can sometimes take a bit of time, half hour, 45 minutes on a large piece, sometimes even a little more than 45 minutes. But once all the wax is removed, you can see what your painting is going to look like. However, don't panic if your painting appears dull at first, because here you can see the difference between the painting just on gin washi is laid on cardboard and when it's put uh, over white matte board. Gin washi is extremely thin and will need to be mounted on a white matte board to bring out the colors. When all the wax has been removed, I attach the painting to white matte board that's cut to the size of the painting. You can use a variety of safe um, archival adhesives. I often use either Yes paste or a spray adhesive such as Elmer's. Just make sure that whatever you use is acid free and is safe for the what you're putting it with, that is the gin washi. And read the directions carefully in your product and again if you're using the spray for sure use it in a ventilated area. Here is the final painting before being framed. I usually frame my batik coated colors much like traditional watercolors matted in a frame with glass or acrylic. It is up to you how you frame your masterpiece and I do hope you try watercolor batik. It is an interesting, unpredictable, but always fun adventure.